So first of all, hold on, Matt. Let's bring Doug in on this. Doug I just want to hear his voice. Doug is speechless. I'm never right? speechless. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a problem I suffer from. Um, I can't sit here and listen to Malcolm Gladwell talking about fact-checking and the importance of it. Uh, not to get too mean, Malcolm. I read your book, David and Goliath. The chapter on Northern Ireland is more filled with inaccuracies than any other chapter in a non-fiction book I have read. Hello, welcome to my YouTube channel. Hope you are feeling good. Today we are going to be checking out a topic titled Next Level Offensive. Douglas Murray slaughtered leftists with his own works. Wow. I believe this is going to be an interesting one. Let's check it out. Go. You're about to watch Douglas mercilessly slaughter best-selling author Malcolm Gladwell in an intriguing slugfest that happened in Toronto. Now, the actual topic of the debate was, should mainstream media be trusted? Douglas goes first. Let me put it this way, though, to begin with. Um, I would say in recent years, any sentient observer of the media will have had their moment of realization, a moment where they saw through something that the mainstream media was doing. It may have happened because the mainstream media, media said something about you or someone you know. It may be, as in my case, for instance, that an entire country got maligned by the mainstream media. It's very interesting, this result. It was a 48-52. That's exactly the result that the British people had in the Brexit vote. Um, <clears throat> now, for proper context, the 48 and 52 votes that Douglas just mentioned represents how the audience voted before the debate started. 48% stood with Douglas that the mainstream media shouldn't be trusted. 52%, on the other hand, stood with Malcolm that the media should be trusted. That said, continue watching to find out how Douglas succeeded in winning them over with his unbreakable arguments. It's very interesting, this result. It was a 48-52. That's exactly the result that the British people had in the Brexit vote. Um, <coughs> You know what? Um, the, when we voted to leave the European Union, w we did so against all of the imprecations of the New York Times, Michelle's employer. We just didn't listen to them. And, and the New York Times never forgave us. Ever since 2016, there has not been one story in the New York Times that's positive about Britain. We have had, and I'll run through some of them, we had a culinary review that said that the British people still survive on mutton and oatmeal. Douglas is absolutely right, and we can all have a little laugh at that. But it stops being funny with his next example. We had uh, the, recently the New York Times drafted in somebody from Russia today, Vladimir Putin's propaganda channel, as an employee of the New York Times, to attack Brexit Britain. And when Her Majesty the Queen died, not ten days of mourning was observed at the New York Times, three hours before they started attacking the Queen. And they did so day after day after day, because they hate Brexit Britain. That is just an agenda, ladies and gentlemen. That's not anything else. Douglas is telling the truth, isn't he? The New York Times is anti-anything that goes against its preferred narrative, even though some still see it as a paper of record. Well, these days it certainly doesn't deserve that privileged title. But let's go back to Douglas, as he tells the Canadian audience an open secret about their media. Your media, your mainstream media, is funded by the government. A totally corrupted system. In 2018, oh, election year, coincidence, the Canadian media has given $595 million over five years. The Toronto Star estimated it was going to be get, getting $3 million from the government in the first half of the year. It went on and on. Now, the figure that Douglas just quoted is pretty wild, isn't it? But Douglas isn't done yet. So you see, the main street, the government in Canada can tell people to, to see, the, they can tell the banks to shut down people's bank accounts. Oh yeah, your government can do that, and if you're happy with that, just think about what would happen if the shoe was on the other foot. The government can do that, but in Canada, they can also tell the media what to do, and the media does the bidding of the, can, of the Canadian government. That isn't a free society's media. That's, I've seen unfree countries all my life, but this, in a developed Liberal democracy like Canada is a disgrace. We're not saying don't read the mainstream media. We're just saying don't trust them. That was well delivered by Douglas. Next, Malcolm takes to the stage to argue against Douglas's proposition. 
I, uh, my first story is I spent the first 10 years of my journalism career at the Washington Post, which um, that is the definition of the mainstream media. And this was in from the mid 80s to the mid 90s in the era of the mainstream media's um, uh, greatest influence. And um, the two things, it was there that I learned my trade as a journalist. And there were two things that were drilled into me at my time there. One was the importance of fairness. If you, if you quoted someone denouncing someone else, you had to call up the person who was denounced and get a response. He goes on to say that as a journalist, you had to assume good faith and talk to all sides involved in an issue. If you didn't do that, your story wouldn't appear in the paper. The issue here is that mainstream media has a set of professional norms in place that work the, the best way they can towards the production of fairness and accuracy. The non-mainstream media is a set of institutions that are outside of that tradition, that have an open and not a closed platform. And you cannot have an open platform and simultaneously adhere to a strict set of professional norms. Malcolm's distinction between the mainstream media and the non-mainstream media may be correct. But then, it's a digression from the topic of the debate. Anyway, he concludes his opening speech with this final point. Uh, now, why am I making such a big deal about this? Because trust is not about content. Trust is about process. And there is one institution here that strikes me has a commitment to the right kind of process and a whole set of other institutions that most assuredly do not. Now, let's turn to Douglas's epic rebuttal. Let me address the, 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 the main point that, that has come out from the other side, which is that the mainstream media has frailties. Sure, it has frailties. And nobody is saying that non-mainstream media don't have frailties. Of course they do. The simple proposal in front of the audience tonight is whether or not you can trust the mainstream media. That is, that you don't need anything else. You don't need any other information from elsewhere. You can just, you can just turn on CBC in the evening and you know you've got your stuff. You can pick up the New York Times, the Washington Post in the morning and you know that there's no spin on the story. It's absolutely accurate reporting. I couldn't agree more with Douglas. Next, he slices through Malcolm's story like a hot knife through butter. I was interested by Malcolm's story about himself because I wonder, Malcolm, if you hadn't have been yourself, whether you would have got that call from a journalist. I wonder if you weren't yourself, if you weren't a New York Times best-selling author, if you didn't speak to audiences like this. I wonder if you were just an ordinary member of the public who'd been grossly defamed in the mainstream media, whether they'd have bothered with you. I'd submit no, because time and again, that's been shown to be the case. But then Malcolm had an answer of his own to give. That I, would I have been called if I were not who I am? It was a very sort of puzzling locution. But um, if I were someone else, would I have been called if I had been, quote, and you, I'm quoting from you, if, I had been, if someone else had been, quote, grossly defamed in the mainstream media. But I wasn't grossly defamed in the mainstream media. I was grossly defamed in the non-mainstream media, <laughs> um, which is my point, right? Next, he throws a shot at Douglas and his teammate, drawing laughter from the audience. Um, I was also struck by the contradictions between the, the comments that both of you made. Um, when Douglas said that he was very upset at the way the Canadian media acted as an amen chorus of the Canadian government with respect to the truckers, I would just point out that the reason Walter Cronkite was so beloved by people like Matt Tiabi's father and grandfather is that he was an amen chorus for the United States government. So the two of you should really get together in the next five minutes and work out your story. One last, one last comment. Finally, he asks them for a definition of mainstream media. One is that I thought that since you guys were in favor of the proposition, you would at some point have given us a definition of what you meant when you used the phrase mainstream media. I'm still waiting for that because what it seems to me that you're doing is you're giving a bunch of um, very cogent and accurate critiques of the media but the proposition before us is not that the media behaves nicely and well all the time. It's whether the mainstream media does. And without you giving us any direction about what you mean with that phrase, I'm a little lost. Now, let's hear Douglas's comeback. Um, 
Malcolm Gladwell said we need to define mainstream media. If we haven't, it's because I spoke to the organizers before this tonight saying, are we going to spend the whole of the debate debating what the mainstream media definition should be? And they assured me not. But we can do. Let me do it in shorthand. The mainstream media, in my view, would be, for instance, things like government-subsidized media that say what the government wants them to say. Douglas further elaborates on this. I would say that it was the legacy media, the newspapers we used to trust once and we don't trust anymore, the ones that used to be the papers of record and which have slowly descended into just partisan hackery of whatever their own particular peccadilloes are that month. Next, Douglas gives another fitting comeback to Malcolm's jab. Um, and when Malcolm says, you've got to get your story right, guys, uh, I know it's easy for a cheap laugh line, but I don't see why we do. We're two very different people with very different uh, careers, interests, and much more. We've trodden very different paths across very wide swathes of this planet. And we don't need to get our story straight for you or for this audience tonight or be in lockstep. Differences of opinion, including on the same side, used to be cherished. Tell you what, guys, the debate is about to get even more intense. Malcolm, given another chance to speak, aims for another jab. There's a, a weird obsession with the two of them with the notion that the media occasionally gets things wrong. And I wonder if they have confused the role of journalists with that of stockbrokers. Um, stockbrokers have to get their predictions right, but journalists don't. The job of a journalist is to use that famous phrase, to afflict, the comfortable, to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. And sometimes that means you go down some uh, dead ends and you chase stories that don't turn out as you want them or wish them or hope that they would turn out. But that is the nature of the business. Oh, well. Now, let's take the spotlight away from Douglas and Malcolm and hear what their teammates had to say about the issue. First, Malcolm's teammate, Michelle Goldberg, has this to say. So I guess the, the point that I keep coming back to is that this critique of the mainstream media, and particularly this critique of the mainstream media is kind of ideologically blinkered, is itself, I think, rooted in a very simplistic and distorted um, view of what's happening both in politics and in the relationship between the media and politics. I mean... Specifically, the idea that there was nothing to the Trump-Russia story. And I don't want to go too deep in the weeds, but this is bananas. I'm pretty sure everyone here knows about the Trump-Russia story that Michelle just mentioned. But in case there's someone who doesn't, here's a sum of it. US intelligence agencies believe Russia tried to sway the election in favour of Mr Trump in 2016. So, the, the point that I keep a special counsel looked into whether anyone from his campaign media, colluded in the, the effort. Kind of but then, after two years, itself, think, we have a 448-page report in which the special counsel finds no evidence the campaign um, conspired with Russia. Both in now, and in the let's hear from Douglas's teammate, politics. Matt Taibbi. Who begins his argument by saying that once upon Trump a time, Russia story, journalists were more interested in what was true and weeds, what wasn't, rather than in whether a story fits a narrative or not. And I think what, what happened with the Trump-Russia story is, what's the upside for a lot of these, these institutions to call up somebody like Konstantin Kalimnik and find out his side of the story? Is that going to get on the front page of the New York Times? Probably not. Uh, and so, yes, there are processes... Fact-checking is important. I do it. Um, I hire fact-checkers to do it. Uh, but uh, it, this is not the standard process for all mainstream media institutions anymore. We, we don't do it as much as we used to. Uh, part of that is for financial reasons. But at this point, Malcolm, sensing blood, jumps in to rip him apart. Wait, I can't, I can't sit here and let you make these statements that without any kind of... We don't do that as much as we used to for financial reasons. I mean, I worked at The New Yorker. The New Yorker, if anything, has spends more money on fact-checking today than it did in the past. Uh, I would have thought, with my first book, I didn't hire a fact-checker, but then I observed the number of errors in it. I also observed that the, the nature of the journalism world in which we live... He further elaborates on this point. 
uh, the scrutiny of journalists is such that it's really perilous not to have a fact checker. And so I, now I have fact checkers. Many other people, I think, have observed the same thing, that there is now so much um, attention paid to the accuracy of things that writers say that you'd better make sure you don't have errors in your... So, I mean, I, Matt, I understand that you do have this wonderful nostalgia for the way things used to be, but I, I, I think that you need to fact check some of your nostalgic notions about the wonderful world of the 1950s. Now, watch as Douglas shoots Malcolm with his own bullet, drawing wild jeers from the audience. So first of all, hold on, hold on Matt, let, let's bring Douglas in on this. Doug I just want to hear his voice. Doug is speechless. I'm never me. speechless. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a problem I suffer from. Um, I can't sit here and listen to Malcolm Gladwell talking about fact-checking and the importance of it. Uh, not to get too mean, Malcolm. I read your book, David and Goliath. The chapter on Northern Ireland is more filled with inaccuracies than any other chapter in a non-fiction book I have read. Again, Douglas slices through Malcolm like a hot knife through butter. It is, having written a not very well-selling but widely acclaimed book on Northern Ireland myself, <laughs> My book on Northern Ireland didn't sell anywhere near as much as yours did, Malcolm, but, but mine was filled with facts. And well, no. your, your chapter on Northern Ireland was so filled with inaccuracies. Irish historians ripped it apart. Would That's that you had sad. a fact checker, Malcolm. Damn. Would that you did your own research. You now, watch Douglas at his brilliant best as the debate gets even more intense. You, but anyway, let me get Douglas, back have, to another, Douglas, another you point. Have a wonder, you have, I, I must say, you, you, you do a very good job of it. But you, you must say, you do have a tendency to accuse those who disagree with your opinion. No, no, opinions no, it's not disagreement. Of being, of being it's not disagreement, of Malcolm. You didn't know, accuracy. You didn't That's know that true. the provisional IRA were responsible for 60% of the deaths in the Troubles. There were basic things that, you just didn't not, know, that, Malcolm. No. I'm sorry, it's not my fault, it's yours and your fact-checkers. <laughs> Um, he, I didn't know just, that the function just, of this uh, debate was just, to rehash uh, the accuracy of a chapter in a, in a book. Well, that you I were the one that started talking about fact checkers. I'm simply saying, why don't you employ some? I suspect. I. That's very brutal from Douglas. But there's more to come from him. I suspect or your publishers, Douglas. Douglas why, I suspect... don't I, why don't I make the point I wanted to make, other than that? Yeah, briefly. Yeah. Uh, briefly. Yes. <laughs> Good lord. So take the Hunter Biden story. Oh, here we okay. go. I'm sorry. A very, <laughs> is, of course you don't want to hear no it. Is there no end to the kind no, of Twitter of stuff you, don't you guys to, are going to drag up Of course here. you don't want to hear it, Malcolm. Of course you wouldn't, because it goes against your ideological pr uh, pr uh, presumptions. <laughs> that story was a big story, okay? It was a big story. The New York Post, which I write for, but the New York Post, the America's oldest uh, newspaper, uh, was silenced on Twitter, was silenced across the media. Back to Douglas in a second. In the run-up to the 2020 US election, a repair shop in Delaware claimed he dropped a laptop off for repair with them. They further claimed that it had super-incriminating emails on it and that those emails demonstrated that both Hunter and Joe were doing corrupt stuff. You know, the Washington Post has now picked it up. It's saying that, yeah, the laptop's true. But why didn't the media pick it up before? Why didn't they call up people? Why didn't they check whether the emails were accurate? Because they didn't want uh, Biden to lose the election. He was their guy. And they weren't going to screw that up. That is well said by Douglas. The covering up of the story by the mainstream media is an insult to every American. If one of Donald Trump's children had committed the same offences as Hunter Biden and got the same sentence he got, which was basically a slap on the wrist, the liberals would be rioting in the streets, burning buildings again. There was a very easy way, Michelle, as you know, to certify whether this stuff was true. You could call up anyone on the email chains and say, did you get this email? They didn't bother with any of that stuff. They'd have been excited as hell across most of the mainstream media, media if this had been emails from Donald Trump's son saying, and I'm no Trump fan, let's not get into that cheap rut. No, the point is simply that this was one of the occasions in recent years where the mainstream media showed its transparency as a political organisation. That's why we care. Okay. Now let's turn again to Malcolm. Well, you know, I was struck once again in listening to our opponents by um, 
how much their arguments resemble the kind of classic structure of a conspiracy theory. Uh, a conspiracy theory is a theory in which one assumes a degree of unanimity and collaboration amongst one's foes, right? You, uh, the conspiracist speaks of those who disagree with himself or herself as if they had a single voice. Again, he throws another shot. And there are numerous really unpleasant examples of this. This is not one of those. This is a much milder, um, uh, more naive variant on the traditional conspiratorial uh, model. But nonetheless, when, so when Mad and Doug speak about the mainstream media, they're, they're acting as if it is, there's a big room, possibly in New York or in Washington, D.C., or maybe in between, so that each party has equal access to the room, I mean, which everyone gathers every morning and makes up the agenda for the day, right? Oh, no. That was a bad move by Malcolm. Guess what? A proper schooling by Douglas is incoming. It's so strange hearing you debate, Malcolm, because you listen to nothing that your opponents say. <laughs> it's quite extraordinary. I've met it before, but never quite so badly as it, as it occurs in you. Mm. Um, you keep saying things that neither of us have said, and then you try to pathologize what we say. What you decide I... to say things like, oh, Wait, it's a conspiracy I... theory. If it comes from this side, it's a conspiracy theory. You see, we don't do our research. That's just, we're just conspiracy theorists. Mild, apparently mild dose of it, he says. Now watch as Douglas finishes him off. Now, you know, Malcolm, why don't you listen to what comes of our, out of our mouths and try to learn something from it, as I am with you this evening? But at the moment, all I get is you dismissing every single story we come up with, every Wait. egregious failure of the mainstream media. I've given you a de definition of what I think of as the mainstream media, so your attempt to claim that we haven't answered it yet is just another straw man in your massive legion of straw men you keep creating this evening. Finally, Douglas ends with this remarkable point. But I beg you to actually consider the fact that what we are describing is even if you think not as accurate as you would like, an expression of a problem that is going on in our societies. Functioning, <laughs> functioning liberal democracies need to have trust in their media. And the best that your site has been able to come up with so far tonight is to say, we get things wrong quite often, but you should trust us. <laughs> that is absolutely well said by Douglas. Now... As we begin to wrap things up, the debaters were given the chance to make a concluding speech. I'm going to leave the stage and Malcolm, pass it over to you uh, to kick us off for the closing statements. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here's what I think the debate boils down to, um, and that is that um, our opponents believe that the mainstream media, um, uh, are, they're concerned that the mainstream media, to the extent that they have told us what it is, um, is filled with people who don't think like they do, and that fact makes them uncomfortable. Um, and in support of this, they have given us a long list of rather predictable hot-button topics taken from their Twitter feed. Malcolm clearly showed that he wasn't listening well to Douglas and Matt's argument, but that's by the way. More generally, though, when we say of journalists that I don't think we should be judging the quality and trustworthiness of journalists by the composition of that group or by their private ideological positions. I believe that in a liberal society that we have to believe that the people who compose our professions can place their professional obligations above their personal ideological positions. And if you don't believe we are capable of that act of transformation, then you can't have trust in any of the institutions that make up liberal society. Now, let's hear from an exasperated Douglas sum up his argument. This side has not been saying any of these straw men that you've been so kindly creating this evening, Malcolm. We've been saying that the mainstream media cannot be trusted that is all. We're not saying don't read it, I repeat. We're not saying don't absorb it. Of course, you'd be an idiot to say that. What, you think we're only going to read substacks for the rest of life? There's not even time. <laughs> That's right, Douglas. I couldn't agree more. But the mainstream media is currently failing. 
it is failing you, the public. It is failing its employees. It's failing at its central task. You quoted one example of what journalism was meant to consist of. I would quote another, what George Orwell said. It's out on his statue outside the BBC. Sadly, the employees do not read it every morning before going in. But, <laughs> but George Orwell famously said that the job of a journalist was to tell people facts they don't want to hear. Again, Douglas is absolutely right. Here's how he sums up his point. The argument we are making is one of hygiene, basic hygiene in the media, in the mainstream media. I don't want to blow it up. I don't want an end to it or anything like it. I spent a significant amount of my life in the mainstream media. We just want it to be honest. We just want it to be factual. We don't want it to chase its own prejudices. We just want it to speak truth, whatever that is. That's not so radical. Oh, is it just me that's wishing this debate never ended? Anyway, let's turn to the audience as they give their vote. There we go. 67% in favor of the motion, 33% opposed. That's what I like to see. So, a nice swing in opinion yet again. That's what we like at the Monk Debates. People's uh, minds, views, opinions changed by what they heard. Uh, it's a, an important feature of this series, and again, it would not be possible without the Peter Melanie Monk Foundation and all of our generous members here tonight. There you have it. Douglas Murray swung the audience's vote, having wiped the floor with Malcolm Gladwell. Now, I'm sure you enjoyed this video. So, if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, what are you waiting for? Kindly do so immediately for more fascinating debates by the enigma Douglas Murray. Also, while you're at it, give this video a thumbs up. Oh, wow. What an interesting debate. I totally understand the facts Douglas have given in this video. I relate with him. You can't trust, you can't trust the main media 100%. It's not saying you shouldn't uh, listen to uh, the news that is being read. It's not, saying you should, it's not saying you shouldn't follow up. He said you can't trust the main media 100%. Because some of the information we get uh, are not accurate. And I, for one, I totally relate uh, with Douglas. If they believe they have not gotten uh, the real facts, there's no need sharing it to the public. Because the public getting to hear it from you, they totally believe you 100% because they believe the main media should, you know, tell the public what they want to, what they don't want to hear. The main media should always stand for the truth, should always say the truth, should always get their facts right. But in a situation whereby what we are getting from the main media is not the facts, is not the truth, that makes people lose their trust uh, in the main media which I feel is not right. There's a need for them to do a thorough research to get the truth, to get the facts before sharing it to the public. And that's what Douglas is trying to address in this video and every other speaker. I understand Matt's point of view. Uh, I also understand Malcolm's point of view. Based on the points that I've all given, I totally in support that the main media should be independent in a situation whereby they are being funded by the government. I believe sometimes there are some information they wouldn't want to share with the public if the government uh, tell them not to share those information. They are going to withhold those information because of the reason that they are being funded by the government. I believe the main media should always stand for the truth and nothing but the truth. And they should do a thorough research before sharing any information to the 
to the public because people tend to believe what they are getting from the main media because they believe what they are sharing is actually the truth, is actually facts. But in a situation whereby the main media is giving the public false information, people begin to lose their trust in the main media. And I believe that is the point Douglas is trying to address in this video. We can see at the beginning of the video, a lot of people voted in support of the main media. But at the end of the video, the vote was interchanged. People begin to change their views, their ideology, based on the fact and the point that every one of the speaker has given. I've really learned a lot watching this video. i also love to hear your comments. Let's get the conversation rolling. Don't forget, click on the subscribe button, click on the like button. Do have a nice day.